On this highest and holiest of days, I wonder if perhaps we might all stand wherever we are as we're able to honor the reading of the gospel. Would you stand? Our reading this morning comes from the gospel according to John, chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, And the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said again to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them. And he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. As we continue on, first I just want to say thank you to the worship team and to the tech folks that are making this uh, happen. I I don't know about you, but I find showing up and Mm -hmm. um, logging in now on Sundays and singing to be really an act of defiance against the darkness. Um, I found myself tearing up over here as uh, we were worshiping, just realizing that there's something about collective worship that we need. Something that I really miss in that. And so I hope that um, you're able to do that. That this is uh, much more than just something you're observing. But that you are, um, you're summoned to participate somehow uh, in, uh, in this very event of worship that, uh, that we're in. And so I want to thank the worship team and the tech folks. Y'all are some of the hardest working folks in the local church nowadays. And so I uh, want to uh, say thank you to, to that. Um, I'm really aware in the text this morning in this sunrise service that as the disciples come into the graveyard in Easter morning, that they are deeply disoriented. Much like you and I must be feeling this morning, the disciples on that first morning were deeply disoriented. We enter into the gospel text. You pick a gospel text where it um, unpacks the resurrection And you will find it amid a wave of human trauma. Joanna Calquat, an Oxford psychologist and theologian, suggests that all of the resurrection stories, once we step back from them, from the years of kind of rushing to the happy ending, years of airbrushing them and smoothing them out, that they're actually stories of people that are deep within human trauma. Mary weeps uncontrollably at the grave. Jesus' friends are locked away in an apartment in the corner of a city that has been absolutely devastated. The Roman Empire's death squad are looking for them all. Judas, one of their friends, has committed suicide. Peter has just cursed his master's name, says he didn't know the man, denied him. Every single one of them have fled. And like a house of cards, it feels like it's all come down on their head. And the very bottom of their life has dropped out. We find each one of these disciples, each one of these characters, in a deep state of panic, of disorientation, of place that we are all encountering today as a global community. Now, each of us have been touched by um, experiences that reach into our well-ordered world and turn it upside down. We've got names for that. Divorce, illness, depression, anxiety, addiction. Kids that kind of go off the rails that we don't know where they are. Um, Our own kind of attitudes that seem to collude against our own freedom. But somehow this collective pandemic connects us not just to that experience, but it connects us to this wider experience that we find ourselves in as a globe 
And whether it's folks that we're reaching for across uh, the room this morning or uh, folks that we long to reach out for across the street or the city or this community or the state or our country, we find ourselves um, connected as a global community. And what is central to this type of experience of trauma and pain and disorientation is the threat that it poses to our core belief about the way that the world is. We begin to experience the world as less solid, more chaotic, more fluid, that it feels as if there are powers that are set against us and that we lack the resources to cope with it. We begin to realize in times like this that we can no longer abate the realization that we are fragile, that we are not as strong as we think that we are. And as we open the text this morning to read about the resurrection, this is exactly where the disciples find themselves in the text, gripped by fear, hiding behind locked doors, the fear of death, the fear of the future, the fear of exposure, not knowing what will happen And John says that the doors were shut tight. That's a description I find to be very interesting. They were shut tight on Easter. This first Easter for these folks was not a time of celebration, but a time of eeriness, a time that was quite ominous. And the doors were shut tight for safety. They were shut tight to keep the men shut tight in order to hide. And as an odd place we find ourselves in the very similar place as the people of God this morning shut behind closed doors each of us somehow might be standing at an empty tomb wondering where God is wondering where the presence of God is wondering um, where Jesus might be the world is not as we thought it but the story is not about shut doors That's only the stage setting. The very next phrase that John says is really pregnant with hope. John says that Jesus came, that he stood among them, and he said to them that he came, that he stood, and that he said. We don't know how he got there, Uh, how he penetrated the doors where folks were locked behind them afraid, but he did. And in this very place, we begin to see the trauma of Jesus has been transformed. The very trauma of Jesus on the cross has been transformed. And if this is true, then there is no trauma that is irredeemable. You need to hear that this morning. That there is nothing that you are going through that God cannot reach through, move beyond locked doors, and stand in the presence to begin to redeem. These doors that were intended to keep people out, Jesus begins to disrupt with his very presence. And he speaks a word that disrupts all the other words, all the other chatter, chatter, all the other presences. And he does so with his new life. I find it very interesting is the first thing that Jesus does with this new life that he has been given by the divine presence of God is to come to people that are hidden, locked away, alone, and afraid. I find that deeply comforting this morning, and I hope you do too. That this God, presumed dead, meeting all of us where we're at exactly right now, displacing all other presences with his presence, all other words with this one word. And in the gospel, he has four things to say to them that they need to hear. There are four things that only Jesus can say, four things that you and I need to hear this morning in our own situation. And when you hear them, when we hear them collectively as a community, when we hear them as a global community, we will never be the same again. The first thing that Jesus says to cowering people shut behind locked doors is this, peace be with you peace be with you. And he extends his hands and his side and they check it out and it is him. For these people are not confronted by a victim, but a survivor. A survivor not only of trauma, but of death. And he shows them his scars. And in a sense, he says, look, my wounds, they're not healed as if it never happened. 
the bad dream is over. He doesn't say that. The story has a happy ending. He doesn't say that. Instead, he shows up and he presents his wounds because they are central to who he is. And we again, again hear what he says to Thomas in an earlier part of John when John acts, asks, or when Thomas acts about the way. And he says, I am the way. My wounds are part of the way. The world is not as you thought it was, but be not afraid. Have peace. And then he says this again, peace be with you. For in that moment, that's where God is. This is the first word of a powerful God to a fearful church that is hidden away. And what I think is amazing is that Jesus not only says this word peace, but he brings peace with him. Jesus is like the person that you trust the most. Jesus is like that person that shows up in the emergency room, comes to your bedside, comes to your living room when your life has fallen apart, that person that you need to see the most when the chips are up against you. It's the dad that walks into his child's room, afraid of the dark. It's the mother that steps into the darkness and everything changes. Everything begins to shift. And this morning, Jesus speaks this word peace into our very lives. This peace against our circumstances, against the anxiety, against the restlessness, against the alienation and the hostility. And this one that stands against and dominates life over death speaks peace into our lives this morning. The second thing that Jesus says is this, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So the coming of Jesus is uh, not just uh, to bring peace into our own lives, but it's also to bring a restorative mission into the world. Now, I'm not sure what's going to come of this pandemic what lies ahead for us. But I do know that the peace of God creates a mission in the world, calls us to be a part of restoring the world, of loving the world, of meeting the world's needs. And that might be in the future community organizing. It might be sharing what we have and being deeply generous to a caring world that has entered into a dark night. I know that we're already doing that at Chapelwood. I think about Fairhaven and the food pantry where we've served over uh, thousands and thousands of families in the last few weeks, and we'll continue to do that. I think about the online Bible studies that are happening. I think about the support groups that are happening. I think about the calls that are being made from our pastoral staff. I think about the ways that we're reaching out to a community, not only through technology, but also through food and through prayer, through picking up the phone. And we'll continue to do that because that's the peace of God that has been given to us that we put in action as a community. And the presence of God amid our very fears opens us up to other possibilities, to other ways of being in this time. And then the third thing that Jesus says in the text is receive the Holy Spirit. And then he breathes the breath of God on them. The very spirit of the divine presence that comforts us in our darkness. Saying to us, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Saying that all over the world as people are sick, as people are dying, some alone. We are part of that great cloud of witnesses that prays for them, that leans into the abyss. And it speaks these words into the world. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And the Holy Spirit is that intruding, invasive, energizing power that comes like the wind to blow us beyond ourselves, that makes life possible in our deadness, that makes hope possible in our despair, that makes healing possible amid our hurt and amid our fear. And so the resurrection is not just about a dead man that comes back to life. It's also about a power that's at work in your life and in my life and in this world that we cannot control. A power that makes human um, life possible. 
makes us um, have the ability to reach out and to do things that we may not do. It's the God that moves through locked doors of our despair, of our fear, of our anxiety, and the thousand different ways that that takes expression in our lives. And says, receive a power greater than yourself amid your own powerlessness. And whenever that happens, people will say that's a miracle. Because of course it's a miracle. Anytime you act outside of your own power, a power that kind of hedges us in and our own fear. To go beyond ourselves, to go beyond our habits, to go beyond our stuck places, our complacency and our despair. People will say that that is a miracle. And this morning, you are a candidate for a miracle. That you can open yourself up to the peace of God, to the mission of God in this world, to the Holy Spirit that would breathe the very life of God in you. And you can become a sight of the resurrection. And then this last thing that, um, that Jesus says that I find to be really odd on an Easter Sunday, but it really is apropos. Jesus says, if you forgive sins, they're forgiven. If you refuse to forgive, they're retained. And at first glance, I think, man, this is this kind of a weird thing that Jesus says uh, first time um, uh, um, out of the box and alive. <laughs> I began to think about it uh, this week. I got a call from a friend who is a recovering addict who told me about the dreams that he has been having this last couple of weeks at night. Dreams about things he has done in the past in his addiction that have kind of just gathered around his doorstep and moved into his bedroom that wake him up at night. Things he'd done that had hurt people. Things that he'd done in his addiction to really wound other people and himself. And he said he called his sponsor a couple days ago and his sponsor walked him through what is known as a mini fourth and fifth step where you take a moral inventory of your life and then you confess that. And they did that. And then his sponsor reminded him of, um, um, of that fourth and fifth step that he'd done multiple years ago. And then his sponsor said, I want you to look, look at me over Zoom. And so they locked eyes over Zoom. And he said, Bill, you are forgiven. And somehow in the midst of all that, Bill received forgiveness. Bill was able to receive a forgiveness that opened him up to other possibilities of God's Spirit. Now, all of us are locked away. Some of us are locked away with family members and uh, we're finding forgiveness, both giving it and receiving it, to be vital if our family is going to make it. We're facing folks that uh, we can't camouflage ourselves around. And so we are finding that having to give and receive um, forgiveness might be the deepest and most important spiritual practice of this season. And as we do that, we open ourselves up to the saving and to the resurrecting life of God. It gives us and opens us up to other possibilities. I wonder this morning, locked away as we are, away from each other, away from this community of faith, but still connected and gathered. If you can hear the words of Jesus this morning, peace be with you. A new root system is possible in your life. As the Father has sent me, so I will send you. There will be new possibilities for the church in the coming days. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive a power that is greater than yourself in these moments and operate out of that power. And forgive one another and receive forgiveness for in that rhythm, we will find the resurrected power of Christ. May you and I become a sight of the resurrection this morning. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.